Okay, so uh, this code that we wrote was about setting up the um, that share ability. Uh, we can start to now uh, set up the ability for the save comic to work. If you um, recall, the whole point of the project is that we're saving uh, items of the uh, of of what is a comic that's going to be using our database and I mentioned it a while ago so remind me what is the name of the database library we're using in this project PouchDB. PouchDB so we need to add PouchDB to our project it's a JavaScript library so in your web browser let's go to PouchDB.com PouchDB.com uh, did any of you, since the first time I mentioned it, kind of browse the PouchDB website a little bit to get a little familiar with it? Okay, good. Good. So if you, uh, if you did browse a little bit through it, we're going to start implementing this stuff. This is pretty cool, pretty exciting, because PouchDB is a self-contained database system. It doesn't require a server, but it can be set up to connect with a server. If we want to, we can replicate all of our data to a real server in the cloud and have persistence in our data. We'll start off with it just working on the device. So on the device itself, the database will basically be in our app in the device persistently. So we turn off the device, we come back to it, it's all still there. Obviously, if we uninstall the app, then we totally destroy all of the data. So we're going to set up the database with PouchDB. We're going to have the classic operations of any database. Creating a database, storing records to the database, retrieving records, updating records, deleting the whole database, and so forth. It's just that this is going to be based on JavaScript, um, JavaScript syntax that we're used to, and the idea also of the JSON format. We're going to put data in the database in a JSON format. So at the top right corner, you can click Download version 634. And if we scroll down, we'll see here PouchDB file can be downloaded directly. We want the compressed production ready version. So we want the minified version. Uh, right click or click on it to save it. That's going to download somewhere. Chrome, from in my case, is saying you're about to download a weird JavaScript file. Do you want to keep it or discard it? You should be safe, so I want to keep it. That's a JavaScript file, which then you need to move into your project folder. So I downloaded pouchdb634.min.js. Move that or copy it into your scripts folder in Visual Studio. Remember, you can drag and drop. So I downloaded PouchDB, and mine went to the, to the desktop. I'm going to drag that into my scripts folder in the WW folder in Visual Studio. OK, so in Visual Studio, I've got PouchDB634. In my HTML file, I need to reference it. Oh, one quick thing. Uh, I, I mentioned before, if you simply click on a file, oftentimes Visual Studio will think you want to open it, which I think is annoying. If you want to turn that yeah. off, you can, press the, you can turn on and off this button right here. To me, it looks like Mario's cap from Super Mario Brothers 1 but it's a little tab preview selected items 
So if you don't like it, because I don't like it, I want to double click my file to open it. But simply by clicking once on any file, Visual Studio thinks you want to view it at least, and it'll open it on the right side here. Very weird. So I don't want that automatically to open, so I like turning that off. Preview selected items? No. Okay, so we've got uh, the pouch file. In the index.html file, then, we need to reference that JavaScript library so all of the PouchDB code is active. Open up the HTML file, index.html. Let's go to the very bottom where we've got our links to all of our JavaScript libraries. Sure. Sure. What point? Well, after you download it, all you have to do is drop that uh, downloaded file, wherever it ended up, uh, drop it into your scripts folder in Visual Studio. If you didn't see, sometimes it's tricky where it downloaded, so just check your, uh, you know, whatever your browser tells you it downloaded it, maybe press the button to open it up in the downloaded folder. Mine went to the desktop, but sometimes it goes over to the downloads folder. So in the project, I've got the pouch file in my scripts folder. In the HTML file, we're going to uh, write a um, little bit of a code here. So we've got a link over to the jQuery file, a link to the jQuery mobile, and Cordova. Before Cordova, new line at, a, at about 190 in the index HTML file we're going to write a JavaScript uh, we're going to write an HTML tag that links to that JavaScript file script source is equal to scripts and this is so cool here where I can select the actual folders without having to type it myself and mistype it and then I want pouch db so you can use the arrow keys and then press enter to pick the file and the tag. So because I've got pouch in my scripts uh, folder and I've linked to it in the HTML file, now I can use all the power of what PouchDB is. We have a local copy of it in our own project so that we're not relying on an internet connection. Uh, we saw back on PouchDB website there was also a way to include it uh, from the CDN, which is the server. And we could do that, but again, if it's better as often as possible to rely on an offline app structure, uh, we can't always assume that the person has an internet connection. Um, so if we have the files included in our own project, we, we ignore that problem of a no internet connection. But what happens is, of course, our project gets larger because this pouch file that we downloaded, it's another extra 148 kilobytes. It's not so big in the grand scheme of things, but having all of these files as part of our project definitely bulks up our project. OK, so we've got pouch inside of our project. I'm going to look briefly at the guides on the website. Actually, uh, API is a little better. It's a little bit more technical. It's a little bit more techy speak, but you'll often refer to this documentation more than the guides, which are a little bit simplified. So, uh, PouchDB is asynchronous. Supports callbacks, promises, and async functions, etc. Okay, callbacks. Uh, basically, everything that we do in Pouch is going to be some object dot some method with some arguments required and some optional options, and then technically some callbacks, which are options. Remember, I said over at Cordova documentation that they use the standard syntax of most documentation. What does the square brackets mean in documentation? Options, yeah. 
So anywhere where you see this documentation and you've got stuff in square brackets, it's probably not an array. It's an optional argument. So callbacks. Almost everything that we do in pouch will result in either an error or a success result object that is thrown back at us. Uh, so we have to then deal with uh, the error uh, result object or the uh, success. Here I, uh, it annoys me that they call it result. We're going to call it success. We're going to have error and success objects. Because that's either of what both happens. Either you successfully <laughs> saved something in the database, success, or there was an error. So error, they're calling it result. Um, we can work with promises, if you know how to use promises. OK, keep going. Creating a database. So we're going to have the keyword new to instantiate a new pouch DB object. And I guess technically, it has two optional parameters. The name of the database, which I'm surprised that's optional. And then options, such as what sort of database structure and other things. So they're all listed here. Um, auto compaction adapter, what sort of internally internal database it's running, limits of revisions. You have a, a default of 1,000 revisions per, I believe that's per document. So one comic can be updated a thousand times, apparently. That's the default. That can be changed. Options for connecting to a remote database on a server. Great. Scrolling forward. OK, here's a real example. Var, creating some variable with some name. We'll call it DB, very simple. New object, new instance of the object pouch with some name internally, DB name. We'll call it comics or something. And if we wanted to do this off of a server, well, if the server is properly set up, then we'll be able to connect to the server and either create the database on the server or read from the database on the server. OK, so back to our code. Index.js file. All of the code we've got up to this point um, has been for these other operations of the login and all of that. I'm going to make myself a big old obvious um, comment here so that at a glance I can see where our next like 500 lines of code are going to be. And yeah, we're going to write like at least 500 lines of code of just pouch DB. forgot to count it, but it is a lot. So we'll spend several days on this because it's going to be a lot of code to do all of these relatively conceptually basic things. It's obvious when you use some sort of app, I press a button, it does something. Well, someone had to program dozens or hundreds of lines of code for that something to happen. And we are going to set up, here's a comic. We're going to save Superman number 1, 1937. Save. Well, it's going to need to capture all of those fields, save it to the database and everything. So it's going to be lots of lines of code. Then to retrieve it and to view it and everything. Those comments there are just for me to have it all <coughs> obvious and visible. VAR space DB equal to new and we'll call this to test this out my comics oops pouch db quotes my comic we have now access to the object pouch db like we might have previously had access to the object of math.random. Don't write this, but math.random. So we, have, we would have the object of math, where we could use these methods, randomize, and so forth. Well, now we're going to have the ability to do various things, such as db.put something to a database. At 
the very least here, um, we've got here a, a database, an empty database here now, where we can start to save um, the we can start to save the, uh, the 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 records of the database. Well, thinking back, we have the ability to um, have different users, don't we? One person can log in and have their own comic collection, and someone can also log in and have their own comic collection. So at the moment, unfortunately, all users would be using the same database, and that might be a problem. So instead, we want to create a database based on the user that is logged in. So we can do that instead of by hard coding a value here based on the person's um, name that is logged in, which is stored in local storage. Dot get item. we're using is logged in all of this it's not that short but it's a shorthand about who is logged in is logged in is what we're storing is where we're storing the person's email address so technically here we're creating a new database based on the person's email address therefore we can have different databases for different people Making a note here, create a new database, create or access um, a new database. Create or access a database based on the logged in user. idea here we're not thinking of a, of a variety of possibilities because this is out there floating without any sort of trigger it'll happen right away but we haven't perhaps actually at this point defined who is the person logged in let's comment this one out because we have to do it a lot smarter than that this is the basic concept to create a database. But we need to be a lot smarter than this. So first let's create, let's do again var db. This time we're not going to actually uh, assign it anything. Because based on who has logged in, then uh, access or create the database. So. We're going to have a function that we want to call, called initDB, initialize database. On the fly, we want to be able to initialize either connecting to an existing database or creating one. This up here would have worked with a very, very, very simple project. We're going to be pretty complex. So we need to initialize a database based on who is logged in. And later on, we're going to have a, a button to delete the database. Let's say a person wants to completely delete the, the whole collection. They just don't want it anymore. We're going to have a button that says delete database, delete my collection. So that means we're going to need to reinitialize a brand new database for another person. So it'll be better to have some sort of function that we can reuse every time we need to connect to or create a database. Function to create or access a database when necessary. Inside of this function, we'll create a variable, local scope variable called current db.
and from here this is going to be the local storage dot get item is logged in so whoever is currently logged in this is going to be this is going to capture an email address the current database of this user victor at victor.com next line this is where we then do db is equal to new instance of pouch db notice db is capitals capital p capital db that's just the way it is the specification requires that it's capitalized in this way got current db so now we're saying in a way that is more reusable um, create a database based on the person's email address and we're going to return that database out to the larger scope of the project based on who is currently logged in. Instantiate a new pouch DB object. All right, a new database um, based on who is logged in. Object to the to the global scope. function that we can run as necessary to do the access or creation. Where we need it to run is back where we've got the original if else block that checks who is logged in. This is set up to check who is logged in, but the way the place that that's set and accessible uh, is back up where we've got our original if else. Let's back. Let's save that and then back up to the top, uh, line forty something, where we've got our original if else statement. Let's see. Back at the top. Here we go. Line forty ish. Uh, if else to check if a user is logged in. So in the else section is where we are. Uh, confirming that someone is logged in and this is where uh, is logged in um, can uh, help us out so uh, before we change the uh, before we do any of this other visual stuff in its DB confirm someone is logged in so initialize the database. To see if this is working so far, what we could also do is do a console log db. 
DB is our shorthand for the whole database. Everything, <coughs> everything stored inside of it. So uh, if we save it and run it here, and we check our console, um, this should give us some feedback, either some error messages or hopefully some feedback that says we've got some sort of database, which is empty. Uh, and this will be at a point to, to pause just to see if this is working. I'm going to run it off of my uh, sim uh, simulator first. Okay, so I got some output here. It says object TE from line 44. So my line 44 is right there, the initialization output. If you drill down a little bit, you'll, you'll see some, some stuff. Uh, TE, I'm not exactly sure what TE stands for, but then inside of that, it says there's objects, etc. Uh, there's a name. The name of this database is based on the last user I logged in. Internally, this is an index DB uh, powered database. So if you're getting any errors, let's pause. If it worked, it should be something like this that it's showing, yes, you have an object. You have a database object. And further inside, it should have a name based on the last account you logged in with. And look at that, prefix of pouch. So there's an object that also internally has something called pouch with the name of your database. I've got something. Let's pause here. Anyone have a little trouble? I'm going to check it also on my real device just to, to see that. I would remind us, I think most of us remember this, but remember to check your error list. While you're working here in Visual Studio, if it doesn't quite work, I'll come help you, of course. But take a look also in your error list, and that might guide you to certain lines where something might be fishy. So you see this way, in this, in this case, it was a little faster for me to go to the simulator. I got something to look at quickly, and here I'm still waiting for my device. Anyway, here it's popping up. Okay, let's see it's loading up. Um, it worked basically, but I do see a little bug in Visual Studio that it doesn't show my very first console log, but other ones it is showing for example these ones that are triggered by the back button that's why I also tested it in the browser so I'm gonna move on everyone got that anyone need a little help 
Okay, so the database exists in the device and I'll mention a way to clean it out later if you need to test it um, but basically this database exists within your app on the device that's what we did all all of here created a database in a little more complex way than the example which was necessary for us because we have more than one user is the example of how to connect to this on a server it's obviously more options and such later we will use db.destroy we have a way to delete the whole database that line and it simply does it but what we want to do is to create um, you know eventually it'll be a button and it'll ask are you sure you want to delete your collection and we'll do all of that later after this, okay, create, update a document. So uh, documents are these JSON objects that we're going to store to the database. DB dot put. Every document requires an underscore ID field. We can create as many fields as we want. Title of the comic. A year of the comic, anything about the comic, but everyone needs a unique ID. So think about it like, uh, let's say, on a social network. Uh, everyone can log in to the social network, create an account. There could be more than one victor in the social network, but there can only be one with a specific email address. So we need some unique identifier that will separate one record, one document, from another document the underscore ID in our screen save comic we created previously a form where we're going to ask for the title of the comic the number of the comic the year of the comic publisher notes eventually we're also going to have the barcode scanner to scan the barcode and to take a photo of the comic We'll start with these. So based on these fields that we've asked as required, we're going to be able to then create a unique identifier. Because let's say, here just as an example, I, I want to save Spider-Man number one. Well, throughout the history of this character, there have been several instances of Spider-Man number one. One in 1963, one in 1999, one in 2014. There's been many Spider-Man's number ones. So we then also then need to keep track of the year. Based on that, that should give us something unique enough to create an ID that doesn't conflict with another Spider-Man number one. So that's why we've got the requirements of the name of the comic, the year of the comic, the number of the comic, and based on all of that, the purpose of that is to create the unique identifier. In our form, open up the uh, index.html and let's find the form where we're asking to save the comic. That's over on approximately line 150. In the HTML file. We've got a form here. We've got all of these fields in title, in number, in year, in publisher, in notes. Those are all of our input fields. We need to create variables for all of those because we're going to capture what's written inside of them to start to store them in the database. So we're going to create a JavaScript object for the form in total and pretty much all of those um, all of those fields we'll start with the the form itself so uh, it might be useful to view both of these files at once you can right click one of the columns new vertical tab group
Okay, so this is going to be a form. So this brings us back to what we did previously. There's a form submittal event that we need to prevent. Uh, so setting myself up here in the section of pouch DB. Yes, we, we have at the top a spot where we started to create variables, and we can continue to do so. What I want to do is group together all of the code regarding uh, pouch DB as much as possible, because it is going to be a lot of code. So I'm going to say back on line 176 or so, which is our pouch DB area, uh, that's where I want to start to create some of these objects. So if we want a variable that represents the whole form itself, uh, that'll be dollar $L. Um, form save comic is equal to dollar symbol dollar selector quotes don't forget the pound sign form save comic The other variables, the other input fields, we're going to create them inside of a function that runs when we submit the form. So if we've created a variable that represents the whole form, we need to create an event listener to listen for the event of submitting the form. We can do that before the. What's that? Did you already create the ID of the form itself? It should have been there. Let's confirm. That's going to be right there on the form uh, ID uh, before the field set. Yes. So after the initialize db function, we're going to create one of our first of many event handlers here, event listeners. So l form dot submit sorry l form save comic. Careful about that autocomplete l form save comic. Dot submit okay so we've got the object representing the form and we've got the submit method once a person presses submit um, start to then capture what the person wrote in those fields well, uh, this form has that built-in behavior that will refresh the screen that will mess things up. So we have to do like we've done before to prevent the, the behavior. So func anonymous function, parentheses, curly braces, event, object, which will be passed into fn, function save comic. Here, if you'd like, uh, uninitialized, uninitialized, uninitial, no spell check on this, uninitialized uh, database over here, um, form field object, and then down here, event listener for submitting form. Submitting the save comic form, capturing event. So if we're saying, okay, there's a form, we're going to press submit. It's 
can run the function function save comic, which we need to write to then prevent default. So right above it. db and then function function save comic event object and function save comic important thing to start off event.prevent default So inside of the save comic, we're going to have a variable called a comic. For the moment, I'm going to write some pseudo code here, some, some fake code, just to uh, explain something. Ultimately, the purpose of this function is, is this. To put a comic into the database. We created, a com we created the database up with initialized DB. Uh, on pressing the submit button, we want to bundle together all of the information of one comic, what they've filled into those fields going to be in JSON format. It needs the underscore ID plus all the other fields that we created. So all of that's bundled together as the one temporary variable a comic, the local scope variable a comic. <coughs> that we're then finally using the put method to put that data into the database. That's ultimately breaking it down in the basic way. In order for this to fully work, as I said, there's more than one instance of Spider-Man number one based on years and all of that. Um, the, the there's the comic also called the Amazing Spider-Man. So whenever you see like a, 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 a glossary or an appendix of something, a dictionary definition of something, do they pay attention to that, to that word? If this were to be alphabetized, would this be under T or A? T. It would be under T because it's not smart enough, it hasn't been programmed to ignore the in our app. But on a real app, most likely it would be under A. 
because it was programmed to recognize the and ignore the. So we need to do that as well, because right now, if the person typed The Amazing Spider-Man, and we retrieved a list of all comics, this would be in the T's and not the A's. Um, besides the in a title of things, are there any other words that sometimes are ignored alphabetically? A. A good book, let's say. A good Spider-Man book, number one. Um, yeah, A is often ignored alphabetically as well. So, what's that? And. and, possibly. We have a variety of words that we can think about that could be ignored. So that's something we need to think about as well. This is, again, when we're doing this, when we're programming, we have to think about a lot. We have to beta test a lot and make mistakes and just figure out all the things. And the thing is that when we're uh, making our own app, it's hard to make anything foolproof because there are so many ingenious fools. Someone is going to break it or try something different, and the app doesn't behave how you think. In our mind, I know exactly how this app should work. But then as we give our app to, for other people to test out, and they do it in different ways, suddenly, oh, I, they did something I wasn't expecting. So ultimately, I want something like this to save a comic into a database. But I've got to clean up the input that they're going to input. So. We want actually, well, you can comment that one out for your records, but ultimately what, you really, what we really want is a comic that is going to be equal to function prep comic, a function that we're first going to write that will prepare what the person has written to capture everything that they've written, bundle it up in the right way, and then use it in our variable. We could write everything that we're about to write in this function, we could write it all 50 lines or whatever. We could write it here first and then continue and then use it and then put it in. But again, if we create these, uh, these little modules of code, these little sort of snippets of code in functions, we're able to call these functions as necessary when we need it. So a little note here. Uh, the basic way how we're going to save data to pouch. And then here we got the smarter way. First, prep the input data, then pass it into the variable. And then ultimately store the data in pouch. So then we need to back up and uh, create this function. We're going to create it outside of the function save comic so that we can access it outside of the function if necessary. So if we back up outside of function save comic, let's create a function called function prep comic. that uh, reads inputs and prepares data in the right way. And then ultimately here, function that saves data to the database.
when we test this in a little bit, uh, I don't want to quite put it in the database yet, so I'm going to comment out the db.put and instead console log that a comic object. So we will insert it into the database eventually. That code we will reactivate it eventually. But uh, I want to make sure all that prep stuff works how I expect it. So I want to console log it before it's put into the database. Because that prep has to deal with what we, what we talked about a moment ago. If there's a the, if there's an and, if there's an a at the beginning of the title, uh, strip it away so that it's not uh, part of the alphabetization of it. If there are other characters, if there's any way we're trying to prepare the data, I want to make sure it's prepared first before we actually try to insert, because it's a little messier to try to fix what's in the database after we've put it in, and then trying to set it up right first. So in prep comic, this is where we're going to create the variables that store all of the things that the person is typing into those fields. So var dollar val in title. This is going to be a JavaScript, a jQuery based variable that holds the value of what they've typed into the input field title. This is based on the jQuery selector quotes pound sign, don't forget the pound sign in title specifically dot val method so we're saying give me the value give me what they've typed into that field stored into that object and we need to do then comma all of the other fields as well this is why you might have the split screen view because we need to see what is the ID of all of these fields. Let me see here briefly. We've got the IDs in title, in number, in year, in publisher, in notes. Based on that, we should then be able to create variables for each of those. I'm going to do the shorthand here, commas this time. Dollar val in name, or not name, uh, e, what's the next one? Number. So in uh, val in number is equal to the selector of quotes pound in number. It's val, it's value, comma next one, val in. This will be redundant for a little bit, but once you set it up the first time, then it'll work. Val in year is equal to dollar Selector quotes pound in year. It's val. And then dollar val in publisher equals to pound in publisher. Val. And then the last one for now, val in notes is equal to dollar pound in notes dot val semicolon. Double check your spelling, uh, write your capital letters here and here. Um, Visual, Visual Studio doesn't auto-complete this because it's in a different file, but it does auto-complete everything within that file. So double check that capitalization, it definitely matters. I know that we get a lot of people having trouble at this point because of a simple spelling mistake. So the double column view like this hopefully will help you. It helped me. I'm seeing my caps and all of that in publisher. In publisher. 
you can misspell that, and that will auto misspell it later too, I guess. But just uh, make sure it's consistent. Make sure again I did here. Uh, I did the shorthand where I wrote var one time, and then I did commas at the end until the final one. Or you can do the other way, that's var at the beginning of every line, semicolon. All of that data is being captured so that it can be bundled together as a JSON object, eventually like this. So we're doing the capturing. We're going to get to the, uh, the preparation of it about the and all of that next time. But for final testing purposes at this point, we're going to bundle together this data that's been captured so that it then passes it back here to use it here to then do console output. So if we assume that we captured info here, we can create another variable called temp comic. This is data that is temporary in JSON format. So open close curly brace. I'm going to break this into multiple lines. When we did the lesson about JSON format, remember we had a key colon value pairs, comma, key colon value pairs, comma, until the very last one, no comma, and all in quotes, usually, if it's a string. So our syntax here. Quotes, double quotes, underscore ID. It has to be written this way. You can put a space colon, space val in. We'll keep it really simple for the moment. Val in uh, title. So for the moment, it's not correct yet. But for the moment, the unique ID will be based simply on the title of the comic, which we need to do it better next time, comma. We're also storing the title of the comic, which is based on val in title. I'm doing it twice for the moment. Uh, don't worry for the moment, um, comma. We're storing the uh, number of the comic based on val in number, comma. We're storing the year of the comic based on val in year, comma. Publisher and note. Last one for now, note, note or notes, uh, I'll write notes just to be consistent, val in notes, and no final comma, and no comments inside of the JSON object, just the data. So more preparation still needs to be done, but this is capturing what was written, bundles it all together, and passes it back to where necessary. So at the end, before the end of before we end the function itself, return temp comic. First part, capture. Input data. Next, bundle it in JSON format. Four pouch. Then return. 
We return the, the bundled data to a global scope. So we've got function prep comic, which we can run whenever we need it. And what it will do then is check what was typed in the box, bundle it together, pop it back out so that we can use it elsewhere. We saw on the save comic, its purpose was to save the comic. Its purpose was to grab, to use what was, uh, what was uh, bundled together and to save it in the database, which we commented out for the moment, but it's going to the console. I believe at this point, if we save all and test it, we should get some results. If we go over to the save comic screen, if we go over to the save comic screen and type some stuff there and click save, hopefully the console outputs what you typed into the fields. So type that, save all, we'll We'll run it. I'll run mine to see if mine worked, hopefully. And then we'll, uh, we'll be on our way. Let's see here. I'm going to run it off my device. Sure. It is a lot of uh, little details to type, and it could go awry. But conceptually, does it make sense? We've got a function that its purpose is to save to the database. We've got a function that prepares the data to put into the database. We'll have functions that uh, edit the data. Uh, we'll have functions that display the data on screen. We'll have little bundles of code, little functions that will do the thing necessary. This one is named to prepare the data. This one is named to save the data, etc. Yeah, it's a lot of detail, but then here, well, we've seen this. We've seen JSON format before, but now here we're making the JSON bundle based on dynamic data, based on what the person typed. And if everything's named properly and, and so forth, we'll see. So I'm going to clear my console. I'm already automatically logged in as v dot, at v at v.com. I'm going to go to the Save Comics screen. I'm going to type here, Spider-Man number, I'm going to type the title, Spider-Man, comic, number one, year, 1990, publisher, Marvel, uh, notes, first issue, I'm going to click save, I click save here, console output says you've saved and retrieved an object, in the object, I type Spider-Man, I type first issue, number one, Marvel, Spider-Man, 1990. Raise your hand if you got that. Take your hand and pat yourself on the back. If not, we will end, and time flies, it's already 9.23. I'm going to save my code, I'm going to put it in the network folder, we'll do a little bit of lab. Check your error console here before you run it. It might be a good idea to go to your error list first before running it. I have a couple of warnings here that I'm ignoring for the moment. No errors. But check your error list here in Visual Studio. And that might guide you to your problem. So it's going to be a lot of this sort of code, and we're on the we're starting the third week out of four weeks. I don't doubt that we're going to spend the the next three class meetings, the 19th, the 24th, and the 26th on on this. It's okay. We've got the time built in. Month two is a lot of hardcore programming in this database to work. And it's fine if we even need to go into like day one and two of part three. Probably not, but we have the time in part three starting next month. It's already early to talk about part three, but we have the time in part three as well to make sure all of this works. And then in part three, we're going to cover publishing it to a real app store and such. So we have the time to work on this. Let me put my code up to this point in the network folder, and then we'll do some lab time.